Slave labor is being used on a large scale globally, including by many companies right here in the United States. Much of the garment industry, for example, using slave-picked cotton from China. Now, some of these goods have been banned in the U.S., but as the Chinese Communist Party continues its use of these products, different companies out of business interest, different investment firms out of financial interest, and different government officials out of personal interest are trying to block this from happening. But the issue of human rights abuse and slave labor in China is coming to the forefront yet again with the coming Olympics in Beijing. Now, at the forefront of this battle to get slavery banned in China and to expose these different human rights abuses is Nadine Mayenza. She's chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Nadine Mayenza, thanks for being on Crossroads. Thanks so much for having me. So, Nadine, you've been sanctioned by China. You've, you've won the Chinese Pulitzer. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what happened? How'd this, how'd this go down? Well, you know... I guess we shouldn't be surprised because we've seen them do um, baseless sanctions to others. But um, it was interesting waking up one morning and having uh, being alerted to the fact that the Chinese government had sanctioned myself and three of my colleagues um, because of our actions standing up for religious freedom. Well, and, you know, this is the bizarre shift I think we're seeing with how sanctions are used, because typically if the United States or its allies, you know, the free world sanctions a country, they do it to defend human rights. The Chinese Communist Party is kind of flipping the script, and it's going after people for defending human rights. Right. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, tell, tell, I mean, let's start. Let's start off with what actually happened. So, I mean, what did you say specifically that, that they targeted you for? Well, they've accused us of lying. So clearly, you know, the fact that we've been calling out the, you know, the state-led op oppression of Uyghurs, Tibetans, Christians, Falun Gong. All the the people that you sort of regularly speaks out and 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 condemns the violations against the crimes against, you know that 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 finally got to the level um, that China noticed and and decided that we were worthy of having sanctions. I think the other reason is we we've made some pretty tough recommendations to the U.S. government, and fortunately the U.S. government has followed those. So I think they've seen us as leading um, in in the 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 U.S. standing up um, against China. Yeah. I want, I want to go into a couple parts with this and then, you know, kind of the, this shift we're seeing with them. But I know your organizations, you've been, you've been calling out human rights abuses in China for a very long time. I mean, let's go, let's go back to the beginning. You know, and, you know what was uh, some of the first reports you've done uh, right. focusing on human rights in China? So we have been following, we've been covering China since we were first um, authorized by Congress in, in the, the Religious Freedom Act of 1998. And our first, um, the next year, our first report our, of countries, the China was on the front cover. So we've been calling out um, the religious freedom violations in China for many years. And for a lot of years, we weren't getting a whole lot of attention. In the last, you know, four or five years, as these crimes have ramped up to be a, a huge proportions, I think the international community can no longer look away when there's a million to three million um, Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims in concentration camps, when there are these kind of egregious violations, it got to the point that the international community couldn't look away. And now we're seeing, you know, the obviously following the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics and the other actions the U.S. government has taken. And of course, sanctions, which were also a recommendation of us. And that could be one of the reasons we were sanctioned because we have recommended sanctions as well. I see. Now, on the human rights abuses you're talking about, you know, we, we kind of hear the big picture. I mean, what, what, are the human rights abuses in China? How widespread is this? Which groups and how, you know, about how many people do right. we know? Well, yeah, you know, it's hard to know the numbers. We do know, um, you know, like I said, between one and three million in concentration camps. But we've also seen, you know, all sorts of other religious minorities detained and, and disappeared and Christians, Falun Gong, Tibetans. And so, Religious freedom in general is is controlled heavily by the state. It's it's considered a threat, um, but it's gone beyond them. You know where families are being separated, children put into orphanages while their parents are put in these concentration camps or forced labor. So the numbers are, are hard for us to know exactly, but we do know they're huge, and that they they continue um, to aggressively go after these communities. You know, I mean, you've been focusing on this so long. Why didn't the Chinese Communist Party sanction you before? I mean, you yeah, know, right. what, what, what is the big change? And I mean, let's kind of look at the, the timeline of this because they they used to not use this method 
how have you right. seen them change in their response over the over the years? So, so last year, three of our commissioners were sanctioned: Tony Perkins, Gail Manchin, and Johnny Moore. And um, it seemed like that was about the time that the the government also made the designation of of genocide. And so, it, it seems that in the last couple of years, with with the use of ad- advocacy ramping up and focusing on the the egregious violations in China, we had a special report on um, how they've uh, also um, spread these violations into other countries, how they're trying to influence other countries to use surveillance equipment and other tactics they use to oppress religious minorities. So we've really focused a lot on what they're doing. And so we're, we're bringing to light a lot of the things I think they were hoping no one else would notice and has made it a little bit more difficult for them to pretend that these things aren't happening. And then, of course, the U.S. government called the horrific um, crimes they're committing genocide. Um, they sanctioned three of our commissioners. We continued um, to, with our advocacy, continued to lobby Congress, lobby the administration, do meetings, had hearings, several hearings that have, have touched on topics having to do with these atrocities by China. And so in December, um, we were sanctioned. And then just on January 10th, um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken put out a statement condemning China for the sanctions against us. Oh, wow. Well, and it seems like this is kind of changing U.S.-China relations quite a bit. Um, I, I really noticed a big shift, actually, in the United States, really around the time when the virus outbreak started and China started this whole, you know, what, what they call the, the nicknamed Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, named after this Chinese action movie, where the Chinese Communist Party kind of took the gloves off and decided they didn't need to try to pretend like they were peaceful anymore. And right. they, they rolled out a very harsh form of diplomacy. And, uh, you know, of course, we know that it had kind of the opposite effect. And even a lot of Chinese advisors inside China were advising Xi Jinping to kind of soften it up a bit. But they haven't backed off of that. I think, I think quite the opposite. They've actually doubled down on it. And we, we've seen the impact of that where some governments are folding to them, some are not. Uh, but on, an, on a social level, when you're dealing with free societies, businesses, investors, you know, actors, activists, media organizations. We're seeing which organizations have interest in China that aren't willing to sacrifice that if it, if it means, you know, possibly speaking out against human rights. And this, this has been a really interesting thing to watch as governments are becoming harsher, but the, the social structures are not following because of this financial interest and so on. You know, I'm, I'm curious how you've been watching this development take place. Well, certainly with the coronavirus, all eyes were on China um, as everyone is trying to figure out how the virus began. And of course, you know, they had the lockdowns right away. And and as dis- misinformation and all sorts of um, debates about China, I, I think it for that moment, the eyes were all on China. And, and it gave us the opportunity to talk about the other things that were happening in that country, like the genocide against the Uyghur Muslims and Turkic Muslims and, and, and all the horrific stories of forced labor. Um, and it's important to note that this too is when um, support grew in the United States to get the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act passed in Congress and that was just signed by the president. I have no doubt that had something to do with us being sanctioned as well because that was one of these bills that we have fought very hard to get passed. It basically has a rebuttable presumption, which every good made in Xinjiang is used with forced labor. But if if you have a company there that isn't using forced labor, you can go to the U.S. government, get it certified that it's not being used, and then you can sell it in the United States. And I think this is a huge threat. I know Nike and a lot of big corporations fought it, um, and I think that says a lot about those companies if they were willing to fight it. So this is a way that we can say to U.S. companies, you can't use slave labor to produce products that are going to be sold in the United States. That goes against our values, against, you know, any sort of standard of human rights. So I'm, I'm proud that the, the U.S. Congress, in a very bipartisan way, with bipartisan co-sponsors, passed this bill. The president signed it. And, and I, there's a lot of support for it to be implemented quickly. And, um, and I think the diplomatic, again, um, boycott of the Olympics is another sign that the United States, in a bipartisan way, is coming together to say enough.